So Tom, take it away. Okay, I think I have, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, words of wisdom is a lot of pressure, Wendy. <laughs> um, so I went skiing in 1978 to Breckenridge, Colorado. I went with my family, it was my first time ever skiing. And I went, uh, we stayed at a, a friend's house. It was a beautiful modern chalet. And I remember, um, I remember the, there was like this older boy there. He was probably 18, I was 12. He was the, the, the host's son. So that first night I was seemingly bored and uh, the, the host noticed it. So he said, you know, come to my um, library den. I wanna show you some drawings. I have all these blueprints. So he said, you can look at all the blueprints you want, open up every single one, unroll them, but you have to make sure you put them back into the slot. So I stayed up till one in the morning, the latest I've ever stayed up in my whole life. And the dinner party, this was like three Polish families drinking and eating and uh, way into the night. And I opened up every drawing. And I remember the smell of the ammonia of the blueprints. You guys remember that? And the thick paper. And I remember the beautifully drawn lines on, uh, on the drawings and, and the exquisite hand writing, you know? And I was just amazed. So the next morning, Andrew, the host, took me next door and he had a construction site and he was building a, a, another chalet just like the one uh, that we were in. And it was, you know, I, I remember the night before the two-dimensional drawings that I saw and now this was like in 3D, you know, the steel and the wood and stuff. Now my 12 year old brain, seventh grade, right? Didn't understand everything that was on those drawings or didn't understand everything that was on the construction site. But I knew, and I made the connection between architecture and construction. And right then I knew I wanted to be an architect and build things. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about two projects, a small project and a large project. And I'm going to talk about communication and talk about um, communicating your offering. Whatever your offering is, you have to know how to communicate it. So in 2001, I built this glass house. Um, this was for my family. And 2002, we moved in. Seven months later, my twins were born. And uh, this is 5,500 square feet in Northfield, Illinois. And this was, you know, a challenge uh, of building a functional, modern house for a real family in a suburb on a budget. And so I use this uh, house also as kind of like a, a laboratory, an experiment. I wanted to learn about concrete construction. I had never really done real concrete construction above, you know, a foundation. I never done window wall or curtain wall. This is a pure curtain wall. And I wanted to learn on my own dime. I wanted to make mistakes and, and be able to kind of, you know, figure it out. And this is exactly the way we build our high-rise uh, apartment buildings now. And uh, this was also an architectural um, a study of transparency and reflectivity. You know, sometimes glass buildings, you can see right through them, they're transparent, but sometimes they reflect, they reflect the surroundings and the nature around them. I developed a planning module. Uh, all the rooms were 16 foot by 16 foot square. And I created these connectors, these eight foot wide connectors, and I call them interstitial spaces. And so in these interstitial spaces, I put stairs and hallways and mechanical and bathrooms, everything I didn't want in the room so that they would be pure and uncluttered. You know, the other thing I, I thought of is how can I kind of create this, I was really interested in commercial type of construction. How can I create this kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, the rough and the refined. The idea is that you had concrete exposed, steel exposed, but yet it was next to, you know, a very high end, this is a, a polyform kitchen, you know, a, um, a, uh, a white oak, rift cut oak kitchen. So the two contrasting against each other, I thought were really beautiful. And this wasn't a new thing, but it was new to me. And this rough and refined idea you'll see throughout my presentation. 
So this was also a, a, ex experimenting and learning about sustainability. So um, this house has um, high efficiency boiler, which provides the heating and water for the plumbing. It has um, radiant floor heating, a European a radiant floor heating system. It has obviously a concrete structure, so it has consistent temperatures in the daytime and the nighttime. It has uh, solar control for the windows. Um, and then obviously you can see here, I, I, I built this house behind these huge 60 foot uh, shade trees, these deciduous shade trees, and that gives uh, natural shading. So this house was you know, really well received and um, I learned a lot. Uh, it was well published and in 2008, uh, this won actually the uh, AIA National Honor Award for Interior Architecture, which I was really proud of. And this house actually changed uh, the arc of my career. It really made a big impact in terms of um, just, you know, I was able to show what my offering is. I was able to show people what I can do. And um, it was, um, you know, a uh, published house. I, I, I wrote two books on it. And my kids um, remember finally living in there. And my daughter, Etienne, she says it's like living in a piece of art. So the second project I'm going to talk about is Parkline. Um, Parkline is a 26-story uh, apartment building. It's um, a uh, mixed-use building. It's got 6,000 square feet of retail. It's got parking. It's got three floors of amenities. Um, it's a block away from Michigan Avenue. It's a block away from Millennium Park. It's on Randolph and Wabash. Um, it has two types of apartment products. It has a, a market rate product and then an ultra luxury penthouse product. We created the brand Parkline and obviously you can see it's a straight line a view to Millennium Park, Parkline. And we hired uh, Lincoln uh, Properties to be our uh, management company. And we hired uh, Clark Construction to be our general contractor. Now we're, again, this is this architect-led process, uh, architect, developer, and construction manager. And um, Clark Construction did a great job. They built this in 18 months. This is during COVID, which had all the problems with um, supply chain and so forth. But they built it on time and on budget. And uh, sustainability-wise here, too, you know, we have self-shading uh, balconies, high-performance envelope with the curtain wall. We have high-performance uh, heat pumps for heating and cooling. And then all the roofs and all the terraces are uh, stormwater detention, but yet they're beautiful uh, green roofs. Um, so the idea is that, you know, you're creating an apartment product, um, but you're also impacting the whole public realm. We're replacing this old, you know, 1960s parking garage that was dilapidated. Parts of it weren't, you know, weren't even open for use. So we're improving the public realm and creating housing. And creating housing is a noble craft. You know, we are in the middle of a housing shortage nationally and in Chicago. And not only for the market rate units, but also the affordable units. We're really proud of. Uh, our latest building called Full Bricks. It's in Fulton Market, and we're building 375 units. We just opened uh, the leasing center, and um, 75 of those units are affordable. So we're really, really pr uh, proud of that and excited about it. So when you're talking about your offering, what do you have to offer to your clients, to your, to your, uh, you know, people? is you have to have a good, clear message. And there's three main groups that we talk to. The first group that we talk to are like the aldermen, zoning uh, officials, uh, city planners. The question is, are we providing the right product? You know, do we have enough units? Do we have too many units? Is our density right? You know, is it uh, uh, contextual? You know, is the massing correct? Uh, is the height correct? Do we have enough parking? Do we have enough affordable housing? And are we giving opportunities for uh, minority-owned and women-owned businesses to, to participate in the construction enterprise? The second group of people that we talk to are the uh, 
banks and investors. So the developers and the bankers in the room know a project of this size gets capitalized by a construction loan uh, from a bank of about 60 to 65%. And then there's institutional equity of about 25%. And that comes from you know, funds, REITs, uh, insurance companies, pension plans. And the last 10% comes from our group, uh, us, ourselves, plus friends and family. And that's how we capitalize and put all the money together to be able to put a deal like this together. They all have different risk profile. You know, they worry about different things. And we have to calm them. We have to show them that our offering is correct, that we know what we're talking about. The last group and the most important group is, is the user, the tenant, the person that's going to be paying you every month you know, rent for the privilege to live in this building. And why should they live in your building versus the competition that's across the street, the same beautiful building that's very similar? And honestly, you have about five, percent, five minutes to convince them that this is going to be their home. It's only five minutes. Um, the converse of that is that they make up their mind in five minutes. But they're going to look uh, at the amenities of, of all the competition and, and our product. They're going to look at the workout spaces, the co-working spaces, the dog run, all that stuff. But the first thing they do is they come into the lobby. They see the door person. They're welcomed. The door person has a nice suit on. Uh, they have their name on their lapel. They have the Parkline logo right next to it. And they feel like, OK, you know, um, this is cool. And they see the fresh cut flowers on the table. They see cool furniture. They see artwork. The whole thing has a hospitality feel. It's very bespoke. And there again, you have the, the raw concrete, the rough and the refined. Again, there's, there's a strategy to it. Um, so all the spaces are, are thought through. Design matters. Details matter. The rough and the refined. And again, the strategy is, is that if I don't have to cover the concrete, which I love the look of the concrete, um, but I leave it exposed, I can spend more money on the fit and finishes and furniture that people actually appreciate. And here's an 18th floor of Parkline. This is uh, open to everybody, communal space. And um, the, uh, you know, it's a place to meet, greet, um, and connect. And again, it's the rough and the refined. Uh, rooftop terrace with uh, a, uh, a fire pit. There's uh, billiards and, and, um, and ping pong and catering kitchens. But the leasing agent basically welcomed them in the lobby. They, they walked them through the lobby. They walked them through the uh, amenities. Now they're going to go into a couple units that are in their price range. And again, you have five minutes. And so they walk in, and they see this dining room. They see this kitchen. And can they imagine themselves you know, sitting in that sofa? Can they, you know, looking straight ahead at the TV, looking to their left at the cool city view? Can they imagine themselves working from home, whether you're a student or a professional? Can you sit, see, see yourself sitting there at that desk with that cool view in front? Then there's the balconies. 50% of our units have balconies because 50% of the units, 50% of the people want a balcony. And all this is done on purpose. You know, the, the brand is more than just a logo. It's actually kind of melding the design, melding the, the level of service that you're giving, the way you talk, and the way you treat uh, the, the tenant. Everything is, is done, and it just oozes quality. The brand oozes quality. So all this stuff is done on purpose. And this way, the leasing agent doesn't have to say so much. They can answer a few questions, but the design, the brand, the way the service is tells the story, tells your offering. Can they imagine themselves in this bedroom with that concrete wall and ceiling? This is the penthouse uh, view. This is the Parkline penthouse view uh, looking out towards the lake, uh, one of the penthouse units. This is one of our ultra luxury type units. Al fresco dining on the, on the terrace of a penthouse. So again, design matters. Details matter. And you know, people who don't know about design or architecture or interior design or don't really maybe appreciate it, they do know that they feel good in a space 
that is well designed. And they, they just feel good, you know? So design matters, it's super important. And even here, you know, this is a, 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 the, 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 the hallways, the corridors. Again, the rough and the refined, but it's a celebration of the entrance and all the textures, the colors, that all matters. Design matters, details matter. So I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been an architect, developer, and contractor. And at the end of every project, you do what's called a wrap party. So at the end of Jeff Jack, uh, which is one of our projects in the West Loop. We had a party at a pub and there was uh, Clark Construction organized it. We had like 60 people there. And um, there was, uh, you know, the contractors, the consultants, our group. And one of Clark's managers came up to me and said, hey, this guy wants to meet you. This is the steel fabricator. I said, yeah, sure. So he comes up to me and he shakes my hand and he says, hi, I'm Richard J." And I said, Richard, nice to meet you. Um, you did a great job on the steel. Thank you so much. I said, but uh, by the way, what's the J stand for? He goes, oh, don't worry about it. It's a long Polish last name. I said, well, I speak fluent Polish. He goes, OK, Jędrzejewski. I said, sounds familiar. So I said, so wait, how did you get into the construction industry? He said, oh, well, my dad was a home builder. And he built hundreds of homes. I said, oh, that's so cool. So where did he build? these homes. He said in Breckenridge, Colorado. Oh. So right then, I realized that Richard was the 18-year-old boy oh. in Breckenridge in 1978, and his father had given me the blueprint for my life's work. Wow. Thank you.